Hello again, weather enthusiasts, and welcome back to the fourth presentation of the Metro Atlanta chapter of the AMS and NWA's fall webinar series. My name is Sid King, and I'm the current president of our local chapter for the year of 2020. For those of you that are attending for the first time, over the summer, we launched our first ever virtual series to encourage the sharing of scientific knowledge and create educational resources that are free for everyone to use. And it's our privilege to be doing it again this fall following the same principles. Here's the list of our speakers for the fall series. We had a great presentation by Katie Martin last week, and we have three more talks set for the remainder of the series, including this one today. Uh, those all promise to be informative and engaging talks, and for anyone who would like to see any of the previous webinars you may have missed, uh, we have recordings upload on the Metro Atlanta AMS and NWA YouTube channel. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Knox. Dr. Knox is a distinguished teaching professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Georgia. Today, he's going to be giving a presentation on a topic especially relevant to forecasting and agriculture in Georgia, making wet bulb temperature and wedges easier. If you have any questions about this topic for Dr. Knox, feel free to type them in the chat window and we can address them at the conclusion of the talk. Are you ready for me to hand it over to you? Yes, I am. Excellent. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. And as noted, my talk is about making welt bulb temperature and wedges easier. I didn't exactly say easier what, maybe easier to understand, uh, maybe easier to forecast, maybe not. Uh, but those two subjects are intertwined today. And so this is work that I did with David Nevis and Pam Knox with a glancing uh, reference also to work I did with Jared Rackley. Uh, David, uh, David was an undergraduate here at UGA several years ago. Jared was an undergrad and also a graduate student of mine at UGA. The work I'm focusing on here was actually put, published in the bulletin of the AMS a few years ago, but even though it's a little old, I think it's it's really worth looking at uh, for anybody that's interested in uh, understanding wedges, but also agriculture as well. I'll make a fleeting reference to that as well. So off we go. There we go. So I'm not assuming any knowledge here. Uh, I'm assuming that people uh, forget things over time, and that's okay. Uh, what is the wet bulb temperature? Well, let's just go back over some basics. The dry bulb temperature, we'll call it T, is just the air temperature. The dew point temperature, TD, is the temperature you need to cool air um, in order to form condensation, such as dew on grass or windshields or whatever. But then there's the wet bulb temperature that's somewhere in between. And that's the temperature that air reaches when moisture is added to it by evaporation. And so as, as you saturate the air. And uh, as noted, it's between the two, uh, between temperature and dew point somewhere. And some of you may remember Norman's rule from the old skew T diagram, which is the way you find the wet bulb temperature is you go up the uh, dry adiabat, to where the dew point intersects it, the dash line there, and then you come back down on the moist adiabat, and that's your wet bulb temperature. And you'll see this again, because I'm gonna make you see this with new eyes by the end of this talk. Now, the reason I was interested in this was, uh, for one thing, is there an easier way to calculate wet bulb temperature? I was teaching thermodynamics at the time, several years ago, and um, I am not a thermodynamics expert, and I came across some comments about wet bulb temperature I'll show you in a minute that made me wonder just, um, yeah, is there an easier way? And then also applications for it. But as noted, I was teaching thermodynamics, and that's not my forte, or to put it in Star Trek terms, damn it, Jim, I'm a dynamicist, not a thermodynamicist. And so how do you calculate the web bulb temperature? Well, if you've ever taken an intro lab, 
you know about the old sling psychrometer, wet the little footy on the bulb of the temperature and go wee, 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 all the way around until uh, it's done the maximum amount of evaporation. I showed you how to do it from a skew t chart, but I didn't show you how to do it from a formula. And it turns out that the formulas that you normally find for wet bulb temperature are nonlinear uh, or iterative processes. Here's one, an example from a paper by Roland Stahl back in 2011. I would claim that this formula with all its arc tangents and square roots and other stuff is not simple. So that's not what I was looking for. In Grant Petty's book, a great thermodynamics text that we use, uh, Grant says that there is, quote, no simple mathematical formula for dew points as a function of the wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures. And I took that as a throwing down of the gauntlet. And so I thought, are you sure? Really? It seems like there ought to be, because if it's bracketed between the two, couldn't there be a way to use the temperature and the dew point to get to the wet bulb that's bracketed in between it? And so this actually triggered a memory uh, of mine, one of the few things that I kind of felt like I knew about thermodynamics, which is that Jeff Haby uh, on his Haby's Hints website mentioned a one-third rule for approximating wet bulb temperature. And so it's here in big text here. The, the one-third rule is that the wet bulb is the temperature minus a third of the, the dew point depression. Or if you just want to get rid of that and combine the two, it's a weighted average that's two-thirds the temperature plus one-third the dew point. Huh. I couldn't find this referenced in any meteorological research, so it seemed to contradict Petty's textbook statement, but, and it is simple, but does it really work, or is this just one of those rules of thumb that you might um, encounter, but isn't that great? So one-third one third rule comes from a, a website, couldn't find it anywhere else. And so I was interested in uh, at some point pursuing this. And so with David Nevis's help, we pursued this. This is your obligatory theory slide. It is kind of new. I haven't seen it anywhere else, but we'll, we'll just tell you what's going on here. An old equation from none other than uh, William Farrell of Farrell cell claim uh, it was a nonlinear equation that we started with. Uh, David found that. We linearize it with Taylor series, which as a couple of people on this can tell you, uh, I always tell my students that Taylor series are your best friend. They linearize messy equations. Once we linearized it, then we did the next thing that meteorologists always do, which is drop a small term to make it simpler. And then I uh, inserted a new and simplifying expression that was developed by a fellow named Lawrence for relating re relative humidity to temperature. He did a what turned out to be a kind of a similar paper in 2005. Uh, this, this sounds simple. I mean, it's relative humidity equals 100 minus five times the dew point depression. It was essential for closing this problem. And also it turns out to have been essential for lots of other people. This paper in 15 years has gotten 750, 750 citations, uh, uh, which has gotta be almost a record for BAMs in that time period. Uh, so anyway, moving through the theory, you insert one into the other because you always do that, and then you solve for the terms that you want. And I got, with David's help, a solution that has the wet bulb temperature is approximately equal to some factor times temperature plus a factor times dew point. In fact, those factors are related. It's one minus K over for the the temperature and K for the dew point. Ta-da! If you choose K equals a third, then you have the one-third rule. So it wasn't just a rule of thumb that came out of the ether somewhere. It actually could be derived from first principles through thermodynamics and very typical things that we do in meteorology, such as uh, Taylor series approximation, dropping a term, inserting stuff, and solving. So not so hard, but not in any textbook anywhere. All right.
And so just to show you how good this rule is, better than it really should be, uh, this diagram shows you where the, what the error is compared to uh, Roland Stoll's big honking formula for this really, really simple little approximation. Anything that's shaded has less than one degree Celsius error. And you can see for small dew point depressions, this goes all the way to like 60 Celsius. So usually we think small would be right up here in the top left for small dew point depressions and, and low temperatures, also top left, this approximation is almost perfect. It's, it's near zero error up near um, the level of um, saturation in moist cold conditions. So not, not hot and moist, but what we would call clammy or close or something like that in cold conditions. And so, where did this rule come from? Well, just to make us all feel kind of dumb, or made me feel dumb when I realized it, this approximation's been staring us in the face ever since QTs were invented. So here is an example of starting with a temperature that's cold with a relatively moist situation where the dew point is not very far away from it. I've zoomed in on a QT. If you go up, and then down, look that the look at it. The wet bulb temperature is indeed between the two, but more than just being between the dew point and the temperature, look, it's asymmetric. The distance between the dew point and the wet bulb is about two thirds of the distance from the temperature to the wet bulb, which is saying the exact same thing that the one third rule said. So anytime you've ever looked at a skew T and ever done a wet bulb uh, temperature of, um, off of it, calculated it visually, this formula was implicit and nobody seems to have noticed except maybe some weather service people a long, long time ago who told Jeff Habe. So anyway, dough, it was there all the time, but nobody else noticed it either. So conclusion from this part of the work, the one third rule for wet bulb temperature is accurate for relatively moist conditions, say relative hum humidity of 50% or higher for temperatures that are somewhere on either side of like four Celsius. So maybe down to zero or up to 10 or somewhere in there. This might sound like a common forecast problem condition because these are the conditions for which the wet bulb matters for precipitation, precipitation type forecasting in situations that uh, you're not sure if it's freezing rain, sleet, snow, that sort of thing. It also helps for frost damage prevention. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to talk about that right now, but you can ask me a question about that later. So this brings us to the forecast problem and it is the wedge. This is a, an awesome video that, um, click it again, that uh, Jared Rackley put together for his master's thesis work that was published in Weather and Forecasting a few years ago. This is a wharf simulation of an actual wedge from October 2009, and you can just feel it gush all the way from North Carolina through South Carolina into Georgia, all the way down to the Gulf Coast in Florida, past Tallahassee, but also with a little arm that goes into northeast Alabama and kind of feeds back up the valley, the ridge and valley area of uh, Tennessee. So wedges happen down here. We know that. The rest of the world, not so much. When we sent this paper in for review, there was somebody that actually said, do these happen south of North Carolina? And we're like, here's the video. Uh, they didn't ask that question anymore. <laughs> um, here is a diagram that Jared did of his um, climatology of Southern Appalachian uh, cold air damming events, the wedge. And it shows that anytime that he was looking at some event that happened in the Southern Appalachians, it was always happening in South Carolina. And then it kind of decreased as you went south uh, westward, but still Athens firmly in it. Atlanta, more the eastern suburbs, honestly, than the, than the west. Um, kind of funny that way, uh, with an arm reaching down toward Albany and then even Tallahassee sometimes and another arm reaching more westward to, uh, to Anniston and then a little bit to Birmingham, my hometown, and then 
maybe uh, not really over to Mississippi. So this just confirmed what I think we all knew anecdotally, which is the wedge is a bigger deal for Northeast Georgia that is for Northwest Georgia, uh, that Atlanta gets affected some of the time, but there are plenty of times that Atlanta isn't affected and Athens is. And so we get that colder air, sometimes moist, sometimes dry, kind of depends, but colder air at very, very low altitudes in uh, the Athens area quite a bit, and sometimes in Atlanta and even more so as you go up Northeast. All right, and so the also, when does this happen? That was another part of Jared's work. And what we found was that these actually happen in all months of the year. So this is um, number of days per month in a climatology <coughs> for um, all events and then the strong ones. Um, and so what it shows you is that the wedge happens most often in the cold season in the Southern Appalachians, but it can also happen in June, July, and August, at least a little bit. And we've seen that. Uh, we've had some pretty good ones, in fact, in August. Uh, a few years ago, we had a couple of them. So, so we talked about what the wet bulb is. We talked about how it's good in kind of cold, moist circumstances the, for the, the one-third rule to work. And now we've defined what the wedge is. Probably didn't need to know that, but I thought I'd throw it in. And so now let's talk about a particular wedge event that was an ice storm that <clears throat> was not perfectly forecast. This was the uh, 16th and 17th of February, 2015. And uh, this is the postmortem from the National Weather Service. Thank you all for doing this. We have a graphic. I've put uh, Athens in the star there. And what you can see there is that Athens got uh, quite a bit of freezing rain, but also points to the north and northwest and also east of Athens got even more, uh, getting up toward almost a half inch of ice as a result. So it was a northeast Georgia event that just grazed the eastern suburbs, northeastern suburbs of Atlanta, but it was a big deal where it happened. So freezing rain totals meet, reach. 200,000 people were without power uh, from the Atlanta metro area northeast and north <laughs> and a little east. This is what the weather event looked like when it was rolling. And so what you had was a, not an analyzed uh, cold front with a wedge, but one of our familiar stalled warm fronts that we thought would make it farther north with an easterly wind or east-northeast wind in both Athens and Atlanta. Um, but just above the surface, strong southwest winds and temperatures that were well above freezing. And so this is the classic setup for your ice storm, not just a winter storm, but specifically an ice storm where uh, the precipitation falling would not have time to uh, refreeze because it was warm coming down and then the layer of cold air was just super, super shallow, well below 850 millibars. And so here's the forecast for Athens <clears throat> that was issued the morning of the event. And I got this from the uh, Iowa State Mesonet site, which is really great. And so what you can see here is that there was a forecast for temperatures to fall during the night and then reach 32 briefly as the air dried out. So kind of maybe on the back side of things when you go from an easterly wind to a north to a west wind. So, so kind of on the back side of the storm, there might've been a chance for snow or sleet or something, yeah, something like that, but more a backside event, it seemed. Um, but by late afternoon, the forecast changed because the cold air was entrenched in more than, more than the models had predicted, more than was expected. And so by late afternoon, there was a forecast of, um, for Athens of maybe glaze to maybe two tenths of an inch of ice, but the real bad stuff to the north uh, where a winter storm warning was issued for Gainesville and points uh, nearby. <clears throat> and that's where they could have maybe a quarter inch of ice possible plus some snow. But even that didn't really happen. Um, what happened, just to remind you, is that Athens got at least a third of an inch and even more in some places 
of ice. So um, this was a, a little bit of a forecast bust, um, not, not a huge bust in that it was identified, but one of those inevitable things, small differences in the forecast made a big deal in terms of the outcome right where we lived. Uh, so I went into my thermodynamics class and said, you know, that rule of thumb worked pretty well. And so I'll show you how it did. So over here are the observations at two time periods for Athens. Uh, in the afternoon, um, early afternoon, it was 38 with a dew point of 15 and it was raining uh, lightly in Athens. And what happened was, instead of the warm air punching through, um, we just kept getting the, the drier easterly air as it kept raining into it, and the temperature converged on the wet bulb. And so by uh, 2200, basically, um, so do the math, that's 5 p.m.-ish, uh, the temperature had come, up to, uh, come down to 31, the dew point had come up to 29, and so the wet bulb was somewhere in between, and it had already gone over to freezing rain. And so we got freezing rain basically late afternoon and well into the night. So the rule of thumb, here's my rule of thumb for the one third rule. Using just the temperature and the dew point, I got a wet bulb of minus one earlier and then minus 1.3. It actually went down a little bit. Stoll's formula, very close to it, but maybe not as accurate. Stoll's formula, um, was closer to minus two, and the Weather Service reported a wet bulb rounded to one degree below uh, freezing. So um, I did this in class, so now I'm telling the story kind of the other way around. I showed this in class. David Nevis said, that's really interesting. I want to do a project on it, and it developed into the paper that we published in BAMS uh, as we developed all the theory. So it really started from this screen where it's like, saying what was wrong with the forecast and the thing was that the warm air didn't make it in so we had a resupply of the cooler air that was unsaturated and things just went down to the bulb temperature the temperature just basically went straight to the wet bulb with no no warming or anything like that from the southwest and so all other things being equal maybe this makes our understanding of the wet bulb and how it relates to wedges a little easier um, if the if big if the surface warm air advection is minimal, in other words, if um, if the forecast warm front never gets there, which those of us in Athens know that story, we've lived that many times. Supposed to get here, supposed to get here, doesn't get here because the wedge is tough. And at the same time, if the wedge, if there's air coming in that's not going to be saturated, so in other words, you saturate air, but then it moves on, you get more unsaturated air. Um, and then um, what you can do is you can use this really easy weighted average to estimate what the uh, temperature will fall to. It'll follow the, the wet bulb and that's just two thirds times the temperature plus one third the dew point, which is an, a nice and easy rule of thumb. You could have a formula do it, but I kind of like being, being a dynamicist at heart, I like the simple elegant formulas that are backed by theory, uh, which we proved. All right, well, that's what I've got. Thank you for listening. I hope that was interesting and look, sure looks like we have some time for some questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment so I can look at people and uh, we can talk a little bit about this and the, and the weather service people can give me grief for, for complaining about a forecast. All right, thank you. Okay, so are there um, any questions? I stumped you. Well, Sid asked me for a, a question to give him prior to this, and that completely stumped me. <laughs> so, so anyway, Sid, um, do you were you here for that? storm in 2015? No, this was about a year before I got here. Okay. Yeah, good. So you won't throw bricks at me. That was my forecast. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, this is just inevitable um, in Northeast Georgia because the models still have some trouble with wedges 
especially when they're dug in so so close to the surface. I'm kind of hoping that the the new uh, GFS with double the vertical resolution will help forecasting wedges a little bit better because I think that's what's probably missing. I'm, I'm sure there's a precipitation kind of question about parameterizations, cloud physics, it's always cloud physics, uh, but also vertical resolution. Because the number of times Athens gets stuck in the cold air when Atlanta doesn't and the warm front stops at I-20, it always stops at I-20. What is it with I-20? That's what I wanna know. Um, but anyway, it, it happens a lot. So it's kind of nice to know if, if your forecast isn't working out, well, what temperature could it fall to? So that would have been, I guess, how this might have made things a hair easier for forecasters on that day. If they had started to get, started to get suspicious that the, uh, the warm nose wasn't going to make it to the ground and the warm front was going to stall, they, they could have been like, uh, okay, where's this going to end up? And the answer was very clearly about 31 degrees. Um, I know that this was a rule of thumb for the weather service a long, long time ago. When I was uh, sitting in as an unofficial intern at the National Weather Service office in Birmingham, this is before Calera, that's how old I am, um, they had an alarm on their AFOS system. You may have heard of AFOS. Uh, it looked like playing uh, an 80s video game with its trackball. It was cute. Anyway, they had some kind of alarm set up. Anytime in, I guess, winter, the, the wet bulb would hit 32, the alarm would go off because they wanted to know when the wet bulb temperature was, was going to be in that range because Birmingham has some of the same situations where the air is cool to the wet bulb and then they get, honestly, I've seen it more with snow than with ice in Birmingham. But anyway, so, so now you've got a formula that doesn't have to be programmed, a weighted average, two thirds temperature, one third dew point. So I guess this is a bit of a tangential question. Um, that's an uncertainty we deal with a lot when when dealing with the wedge and trying to forecast modes of precipitation is the behavior of that warm front and whether it's going to stall or whether it's going to move north because that is the difference between 39 degrees and rain or 31.5 degrees and freezing rain and right. do you have any any thoughts or any rules of thumb that you like for um, diagnosing the motion of that warm front that's a great question and a research question, honestly. Um, what I'd, if there's anybody that knows somebody that wants to do a master's thesis, what I'd probably do is take the, the list of the strongest events that Jared compiled for his master's and then look at surface pressures because I suspect that you could find that the, one, the ones where the warm front doesn't make it um, and stops at I-20 probably have a stronger uh, northeast-southwest pressure gradient or, or maybe even just a north-south pressure gradient than the others. I, I would expect, because of the way the, the wedge manifests itself in, um, in surface pressure, because it's such a near surface process, that that would be one of the things that would drive it. The other thing that would drive it is that wedges reinforce, uh, are, are reinforced by precipitation. And so the ones that are wetter are also gonna be the, the more doggedly persistent ones. And so that might be the, the rule of thumb. Um, but I haven't done it yet, so I don't. I don't know how to tell you when the warm front's going to stop at I twenty. I, I really think that there's, it's Thank something you. with the cars, right? It's the truck <laughs> traffic, right? It just it, it creates vortices and it stops the warm front right there. Got to be the friction. Oh yeah. yeah. Other questions. I had a quick question for you. Hey, Allie. Does everybody know Allie since we're a small group? Uh, Allie is one of our graduates from UGA who is now a, a master's student at Colorado State University and uh, one, one of our st star students along with Molly who's up at up in my top left corner here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, 
I was interested, you had that, um, that graphic uh, with like the, the occurrence of the cold air damming. And I was yeah. curious, you mentioned all those separate arms and that pattern kind of surprised me. I'm just curious, like what is like top topographically driving that? Oh, good question. Um, so let's see, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, go back to that. Also it gives a chance to look at this great video again. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is this one event actually captures both, both of the climatological patterns. So what I think the, the push that goes Southwest down to the Gulf is it's kind of set up by the uh, southwest northeast alignment of the uh, Appalachians. So even once it gets past the, the, the high mountains of North Carolina and even past the pretty high mountains of Georgia, it just keeps going. And so it just goes zoom right down to um, Appalachicola is kind of where it's pointing at. And that's what we see in the climatology. Um, See that almost straight down toward Tallahassee and Apalachicola. But then there's this arm that goes over toward Anniston. And I am not 100% sure of this, but I got some ideas. Um, and it might have something to do with I-20 in a way. They put the interstates where there's lower ground, right? You don't typically put interstates on top of mountains and so forth. And I, I think that you see the air channeling in a couple of different places through um, valleys or passes a little bit. And so in this video, you can see it going right up toward Chattanooga and then up the ridge and valley. And then the other part pushes toward Anniston, which is not exactly low ground, but it's, I think, lower than on either side because a little south of there is the highest point in Alabama, Mount Cheeha, which is 2,407 feet above sea level. Anniston is less than a thousand and then some of the territory up in northeast Alabama is well over a thousand uh, feet. Pam and I have been up there. That's the Little River Canyon area and so forth. It's quite rugged. So I think the cold air is just basically the stuff that goes toward Florida is just going whoosh uh, just from inertia. It's been going downhill all the way and it keeps going. The other parts uh, just kind of branch off through uh, somewhat lower lying areas in between mountains and then go back up the valleys. Cool, thank you. All right, that's a great question. Yes, we got uh, about three minutes left and let's see, I, I needed to share this things back with um, there. There, Sid, I, I've, I've done it so that you can um, share too. Any other questions before we get it wrapped up here? Can I ask a, can I ask a quick question related yeah. to the question about why we would see the advancement of the warm front sort of stall near I-20? And, you know, of course, the advancement of the warm front is also you know, conversely going to be sort of the, the southern extent of the, yep. the cold air damming episode. Right. And I do wonder, I'm sort of thinking about the, the geostrophic adjustment that's necessary for cold air damming to occur. And I, I wonder if there's anything about it needing to be on a sloped surface. And if you reach a point where it's no longer on a sloped surface, is that going to affect the ability of the damming event to continue? And you know, I'm not the dynamicist here, you are, but it just occurred to I me, like I'm it. wondering if that's an important factor. I like that um, because what it could do, it's kind of a semi-geostrophic idea <clears throat> because it might interfere with the front's ability to move north, um, the, the warm front. It, it, clearly the cold air can keep shooting downward. It just, it, it, it like that video uh, shows for that really impressive uh, event, wedge event that went all the way down to Florida. But yeah, I, what you run out of slope right around I-20, if I remember correctly, that's, that's pretty much where things uh, become much more gentle. And it may be that, that it, the warm air has a harder time going upslope because of the adjustment processes. And it may be that the, conversely, the cold front may be able to get to that point, but not farther south uh, 
for the same processes. That that's actually a, a really really interesting idea because it goes back to the original concepts of cold air damming that go back to the Beaux Arts paper and so forth. That's good. Anyway, that, yeah, just just a thought. That that's a real good thought. I'm writing it down. Okay, Sid, do you want to wrap this up? Yes, we've got about a minute left. So instead of sharing my screen, I just want to take the time to uh, thank Dr. Knox for his presentation. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is share this with the uh, with the other forecasters, and uh, hopefully we're uh, hopefully the people that were here in 2015 don't take it too personally. And uh, it was a know, hard one. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Once a year or so, we get bitten by one of those, um, maybe more often. And I also just want to take a quick minute to thank the rest of our officer team, uh, Steve Gregg, Sarah Tonks, and Brad Rubin for all the work that they do in helping make this a reality. And uh, hope you guys can join us next week. We've got another one coming up on Thursday at 4 p.m. So uh, hope you have a great week and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for having me. Thank you.